The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Youthful perspective on the all too long standing problem of racism. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Tonight on The Agenda in the Summer, writer Habiba Kupo Diallo on her book, Hashtag Black in School. School is supposed to teach you and prepare you for life. But what Habiba Kupo Diallo encountered certainly didn't do that in the way that anyone would be proud of. During her final two years in Halifax High School, she kept a journal of her experience of racism, microaggressions, and violence. The book is called Hashtag Black in School. Habiba Kupo Diallo is a women's health advocate. She joins us now from Halifax, Nova Scotia. It's really nice to meet you. Likewise, Nam, thank you for having me on your program. So before we started, I was kind of, I was saying to you that when I was your age, the entries to my journal were not, were about, you know, boys and maybe not feeling like I belonged. Uh, but your journal has become a book that speaks to the times that we're in right now. What made you decide to keep a journal back then? Um, I've always kept a journal. So ever since I was about 12 years old, I've had a, a journal or a diary, if you will, just to document my thoughts, my feelings, my observations of the world. So it was completely normal that continuing on into high school, I still had a journal. And it just so happened that because of the experiences I was having at the time, uh, my high school journal reflected a lot of those day-to-day uh, -day interactions, that sort of day-to-day -day interfacing with racism. And, uh, you know, high school is hard enough, but you actually moved from Ontario um, and you came to this high school in grade 10 in Halifax. And this school in particular was praised as the most diverse school, diverse high school east of Montreal. But you didn't think so, huh? Well, it, it was the case that it was very diverse in terms of um, the student population, the, the ethnic makeup of the student body. So th that was very much true. However, I felt that it was just represented on a, on a surface level. I wanted to see more in terms of the overall uh, experience for students um, in terms of um, in terms of the curriculum. So when it came to some of the deeper uh, aspects of schooling and of education. I wanted it. I wanted there to be that diversity, which I felt wasn't there on a deeper level. And that also included having more teachers of color, correct? Exactly. Yes. Um, why is it important for schools when we do talk about diversity or inclusion that we're also talking about the makeup of the people who are doing the teaching? You know, seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. That saying is very true. And seeing someone who looks like you uh, in a position of authority or as a teacher, it can really inspire the students. It would, you know, confirm the, the possibility for them that they can go on and achieve, that they can uh, go on to higher education, become whatever it is they want to become. And, um, and, and just sort of move forward in society, uh, fulfill their potential and become who they're meant to be. So you're moving provinces, <laughs> you're going into a new high school, um, but you're also dealing with a lot at home. What was happening at home during this time? Mm -hmm. So um, I had just lost my father actually um, to a massive heart attack at the time. He died in 2010. And then a year later in 2011, um, my family moved to Nova Scotia. So it was one of the most devastating times of my life. I was in complete and utter shock. And when I think back to that young person, to that girl I was then at about 15 years old, I am I think I'm just sort of in awe. I'm so amazed that I was able to do what I was able to do, that I was able to go through school, that I was able to achieve my goals and be so involved and be so courageous and be so outspoken because you are right, it, it was such um, a difficult and, and trying time for me in my personal life. 
Um, my condolences for your loss. Um, I, you. I can imagine too that you uh, everything must have felt raw at the time. So do you think that part of um, the experiences that you document in the book had to do with the fact that you were grieving? I do, very much so. And uh, I write in my introduction that perhaps had I not been grieving, some of what I experienced wouldn't have felt so abrasive. So the element of grief definitely shaped how I received uh, so much of those experiences of racism, so much of that hostility. It definitely uh, contributed to, to how I received them. Well, let's get into what you experienced at school. Uh, you write, high school hurts the black body. High school is hard enough on any young body. All students grapple with stress, lack of sleep, lugging heavy textbooks through icy Canadian winters and up and down stairs and regular teen angst. But there's a whole other layer of constant and in some ways unseen violence that is done to young black bodies in high school that needs to be recognized because black students must also deal with the racial stresses involved in going to school. Those non-standard parentheses are where in part you added notes as an adult. What did you mean by the unseen violence to black bodies? The unseen violence. Okay, so some of those microaggressions, as we like to call them, and, and I'd argue that some of what we call micro is actually macro. Uh, but anyways, um, the, the looks, the, 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 the sense of belonging or lack thereof, uh, the curriculum, the constant whitewashing, as people call it nowadays, um, you know, the denial of not being accepted, not feeling that you fully belong. That's some of the unseen violence because these things aren't visible, you know, but but the repercussions are huge. The buildup, the accumulation is significant. So, so in that passage, that's what I'm getting at there. How would you describe, you call them macro aggressions, but how would you define uh, micro aggressions? You know, the first thing that jumps to mind is when you live in a society that never acknowledges you, you know, whether it's TV, whether it's media, you can watch a movie, you can watch a Hollywood film in 2022, and the entire cast can be white. You know, this is coming out of Canada, this is coming out of America, that are supposedly plural societies. To me, that's violence. And then that um, sort of continues into, into school, you know, when you go to school. And, and I think we also, in talking about this, have to realize that students spend so much time there, uh, five days a week, 9 a.m. or 8.30 a.m. To, to 3 p.m. They spend more time there than they do with their parents. And then when some of that violence is, um, is perpetuated or repeated in school, we have to wonder what this does to the minds of Black students, to their bodies. And when I say bodies, I'm referring to the emotional body, the mental body, so their minds, their their emotions, as well as their physical bodies, because now we know there's the whole um, mental, physical connection, and, um, you know, sometimes what happens in our mind has a physiological impact, or our emotions, if we're dealing with certain stress, certain racial stresses, uh, they can manifest themselves physiologically. That's how the violence expresses itself, this... Um, lack of being recognized and, and you go through your whole life sort of there in that space in a in a space that's supposed to be yours um especially you know for someone like myself who's born canadian we're born here we're raised here um some of us are second generation third generation because we had parents who came and they naturalized um yet we're never fully accepted by by white society if i can call it that you explain in the book, um, there were several incidents where you wrote about where the school held an assembly or event. And on the surface, it looked like it was raising awareness, but it was reinforcing tropes about black people. Um, as one of the handful of a black students at the school, how did this make you feel? Yeah, I felt disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I don't think I, okay, perhaps a little bit sad or I don't know, offended, but more than anything else, I think I probably felt disappointed. I was just thinking like, really, you know, you couldn't 
present the issue in another way. You have to sort of harp on the perpetual tribal warfare, the famine, the uh, you know, gaunt and naked bodies, the decapitated people, and so forth. So I think I, I felt disappointed, and and uh, as you know, um, because as I explain in in the book, then I, I did, I did follow up on it with um, with a member of staff. And what did they say to you? Um, <laughs> I, Okay, she wasn't particularly receptive. She said, you know, you just got to the school, perhaps wait and see some more of what we're doing, some more of our efforts and so forth. However, she did acknowledge that there were some other students, two, two other students um, from that region in Africa that was, uh, that was being discussed in the assembly who also approached her and, and expressed their disappointment as well. So I was happy to know that I wasn't alone in, in that feeling. And that uh, particular incident involved a film called Coney 2012. And there was a controversy that uh, happened after that film was screened. Um, there's a few incidences, too, in the book where it seems as if people um, get their backs up when they are called racist. Or even in the book, you write about situations where you say white people and they there's this kind of... Um, reaction, uh, I think it's maybe easier for people to say black people than it is to say uh, white people. Did you find that, like, how did you navigate all that? Because you have a certain type of poise and confidence that I don't know if many other people at your age um, would have. Yeah, that's very true. And I know many people are uncomfortable with some of those terminologies, even certain black people. Um, I remember being on the train once with a friend and we were having a discussion about race and she had to say white and she she lowered her voice and she kind of whispered it. She's like, white. And I was thinking, you know, just say what you have to say. It's not, so long as what you're saying isn't offensive mm. to, to anyone. You know, we should all stretch ourselves. We should all be open to growth, to learning. This is what they teach us in Canadian society. This is what they teach us in the workplace, you know, workplaces now they talk about edi and so forth the schools they talk about uh, growth fostering intellectual curiosity and so forth but you know is is it true if when you want to have certain critical discussions certain meaningful discussions people start acting foolishly you know so <laughs> so that's rather annoying um but but you know ultimately i say people need to be open to um, expanding themselves to growth. And if they're uncomfortable with something, they need to confront their discomfort and ask themselves why they're uncomfortable. They really need to, you know, interrogate that that discomfort within themselves, you know. You found uh, the curriculum problematic in one instance using the example of studying The Great Gatsby in English class. Uh, the Great Gatsby is considered one of the greatest books ever written. What's in that book that many people might not realize? Okay, so um, let me just go back to <laughs> grade 11, grade 12 English for a minute and think about it. Um, I, I think some of, in, in the book, the way uh, racism is spoken about or scientific racism or the superiority of the white races, because there's talk about that, something along those lines, like the superiority of the white races and the white race being pushed out and so forth. Um, so, you know, inherently, uh, you know, perhaps the author's in, in, intention was to was to shed light or was to bring up a, a, a certain topic. And I don't think it's it's necessarily problematic that students read it, but I do think uh, everything needs to be taught in a context. And I think when dealing with uh, material that is so racially sensitive or so racially charged, teachers really need to, to do a great job of contextualizing because you have to understand that the readers in grade 11 or grade 12, they're very young and they might not have all the tools to, to properly um, understand or make sense of, of, of some of that content, you know, if it is of a very uh, racially charged nature, like I said earlier. And your teachers didn't do that? No, 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 not exactly. I don't feel they did. I felt that we just read certain passages without background and I, I needed there to be more background. Especially if you're a black student reading that in class and 
if you're am I, if you're one of the few black people in that group, um, I always got the sense that people were kind of like looking at you, like, and that's defining who you are as an individual. Did you feel that? Perhaps they were. And, you know, as I document in the book, there were certain experiences that were really hard or that were very uh, uncomfortable for me. I felt a lot of pressure. I felt uh, very demoralized that time. So on the one hand, there was all that. But on the other hand, there was me marching to the beat of my own drum, completely marching to the beat of my own drum. And I feel that that's something I've had all throughout life. And I'm, I'm very happy about that. Um, so on the other hand, I think there was just a sense of me being like, I'm here to do what I need to do, and yeah. And one of your it. teachers described said to you that uh, when you graduated, that she loved it when you came to class because you were just like this bright light, and you were just like you said, going by the beat of your own drum. So um, uh, I want to read another passage that you write in the book. Uh, you write, considering the pervasiveness of whitewashing and the racism that pervades media, advertising, education, and social culture. I would argue that deep psychological intervention is necessary for white individuals to have a paradigm shift with respect to how they view black people. What did you mean by that? So uh, similar to what I said earlier when I talk about the whitewashing, so the billboards and the movies and the TV programs and the magazines, this is something we've all grown up with or something that's been so normalized for all people, black, white, for people of all races, you know, that whiteness is is normalized and everything else is is somehow different. Mm -hmm. You know, let's just put it that way. And and that the white experience is the normal experience. It's the standard. It's the default experience. Every time we turn on our TV, that's what we're told. Every time we open a magazine, every time we reread a novel, you know, you can read novels written by um, other authors, but generally speaking, it's in you know, novels, they reflect the white experience in school when we read books. That's what we're told, that the white experience is a standard, is the default experience. So there's been that pervasiveness and and our teachers say many white educators, they've grown up with that pervasiveness and and they've just accepted it as as the normal experience. And, and sometimes when I talk to white people or I do certain sessions or I, I have interviews on this topic, many of them, they're very appreciative, but they're also um, surprised about the extent to which we as Black people, or, or the amount of time and energy, rather, I should say, we as Black people put into dealing with racism. And then, you know, when we take it home or when we have to be talking to our friends or family members about it, it's just so much energy, I think, uh, so much of our of our energy that could be used toward something else, toward writing another book, for example. So 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 then as a result, you know, to to change some of that, there needs to be a deep psychological intervention. So much unlearning, you know. So when we talk about these EDI initiatives or trainings for staff, uh, this is some of the unlearning that has to happen because we've all been conditioned for so long, for centuries, actually to believe that that whiteness is normal, whiteness is the default, and everything else is 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 different, is problematic, is you know, all the thoughts that 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 come that are associated with everything that's non-white. So that's what I mean in that passage. Um, you also write in the book that this is actually harming white students when we do, so we need to kind of rethink it because white students are not benefiting from this either. What did you mean by that? No, they're not because it can engender a kind of um, narcissism. That's the first word that comes to mind. It can engender a kind of narcissism, uh, a kind of living in a bubble, a kind of seeing the world through a singular lens, through the lens of your experience only when the world is, <laughs> again, to use that corny word, melting pot, a melting pot of experiences, a melting pot of cultures, a melting pot of races. Um, so it, it does harm white students. And sometimes when they're forced out of that bubble or when that, um, yeah, when they're forced out of that bubble, uh, it, it can be difficult for them. That's why 
to 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 speak of what you mentioned earlier, people sort of backing up against a wall or becoming defensive when you talk about racism or when you talk about whiteness. That's it sometimes. It's it's that discomfort. It's their foundation is being challenged. It's everything they've learned is being challenged. And it comes with the kind of defensiveness, uh, even hostility, you know. I've seen it come with hostility. I'm sure you have as well. So no, it, it doesn't benefit white students either. You dedicated the book to all the black high schoolers and students of the world, uh, and you said, rise up. Um, your mom is Afua Cooper. She teaches at Dalhousie University. She's a historian, novel novelist, and she's been on this program uh, many times before. Uh, you also wrote about how you understand why black students might drop out from high school. Do you think you would have been able to push back the way that you did if you didn't have your mom's support and guidance? Yes and no. It's a it's a great question, um, and you know I'm very grateful to to have been brought up in a very nourishing home environment. Uh, I was brought up with a rich sense of culture, a rich sense of who I am. So so this greatly contributed to my sense of self worth and to my sense of value in a world and in a country and in an environment that is constantly telling you that you don't have value, that is constantly telling you that you're worthless. And as I say this, I'm so aggrieved because this is the harm, this is the violence that I really hope people will begin to understand that happens to black kids day in, day out. Um, but anyways, uh, so yes and no, she, she definitely did encourage me and helped to give me that sense of confidence. But the pressure is so great, so sometimes even having that sense of confidence or coming from a, a family environment that encourages you, that gives you a, a great sense of culture um, is not enough. Sometimes the pressure alone, the violence of racism, that in itself can erode any confidence uh, that you might have received um, at home. And I know other black uh, students or other black people who have grown up in an environment similar to my own and frankly, they didn't make it. They just didn't make it. That's the pressure of the society. Uh, that's that's the violence of racism. It eroded them. So 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 yes and yes and no. And um, while it's great, and while I do encourage all parents of black children to really lift up their children at home, to boost them, to you know so forth, instill a sense of value and so forth into them. I I really. It's not enough, and and you know there needs to be more than than just telling those parents to do that because it's really not enough, and it's it's a lot on the parents too. Well, I, I totally agree. I have two small kids, and my son, the older that he gets, the more worried I become. Um, there's so, only so much I can do at home, but once he goes out into the larger world, uh, there's very few things that I can control. Uh, but Habiba, thank you so much for sharing your journal with us. Thank you for putting it in, into a book. And congratulations on all of your success. We really do appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. Thank you very much, Nam. It was my pleasure. An unexpected phone call to Confederation College solved a decades-old mystery about two paintings by the renowned artist Norval Morisot. Charnel Anderson covers the Northwest for Ontario Hubs, and she joins us now from Thunder Bay to explain. Hello there. Hi, Dan. All right, for those who are not familiar with the late Norval Morisot, you can tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, so uh, Norvell Morisot has a pretty impressive CV. Um, he founded the Woodland School of Art. He was a member of the Indian Group of Seven, and he was also the first Indigenous artist in Canada to have his work featured at a mainstream art gallery. And so it's for those reasons that Carmen Robertson, who is an art historian and an expert on Norvell Morisot, who I spoke to for the story, she calls Morisot the Mishomis, or the grandfather of contemporary Indigenous art. And as Carmen explained to me, Morisot was born in Fort William in 1931, um, he was sent to live with his grandparents on Sandpoint Reserve, which is today called uh, Bingwini Ashi Anishinaabek, which is a small community on the shores of Lake Nipigon. And that's really where Morriso learned about Indigenous spirituality and Catholicism, these themes that would go on to influence his work. 
And, you know, despite his credentials, he never actually received any formal art training. Um, as a young person, he worked various jobs in Northwestern Ontario, uh, like highway construction and pulpwood cutting. And he also got a job at a gold mine in Red Lake, which is where he began meeting other artists who um, taught him about various European art traditions and also supported his work as an artist. So within about a decade, uh, beginning in the 1960s through the 1970s, Morriso found um, commercial success as an international artist with exhibitions in not only Canada, but the US and Europe and the rest really is history. All right, I wanna talk about two paintings, Demigod One and Demigod Two. These two paintings were donated to the Confederation College in Thunder Bay in the 1970s and then stolen from this lobby in 1981. What exactly happened here? Yeah, so that photo was taken in the 70s, I believe, but um, you can see the paintings there in the foyer. And based on news reports, shortly after the theft, it appears that two people, uh, two young people walked into the college and everyone at the college sort of thought that they were there working, um, you know, perhaps removing the paintings so they could move them to another part of the building, which um, apparently was not uncommon at that time. Um, but, you know, eventually people caught on when they realized the paintings were missing, <laughs> they were no longer in the building. And, you know, it's been a long time, but uh, no one's been arrested in relation to these thefts. Um, however, spokesperson for the Thunder Bay Police Service says the investigation remains ongoing. Um, however, after the theft, we know uh, from court documents that the paintings made their way to an art gallery in Montreal, uh, which no longer exists. And it was there from that art gallery um, in 1981, the same year the paintings went missing, uh, that a Montreal-based lawyer and art collector purchased the paintings for $7,000, which, um, according to court documents, he didn't know were stolen until 2018. All right, so take us to where we are now. Uh, we sort of know that these paintings have sort of resurfaced. How exactly did they sort of come about? Yeah, so I spoke to uh, Mike Rosig, who uh, works in public safety at Confederation College, and he told me shortly after he started his job there in 2018, he got a phone call from an art curator. And the art curator told him that she was aware of two Norval Morriso paintings for sale in Montreal. And she was also aware that these paintings had been stolen from the college decades uh, earlier in 1991. Um, and Mike wasn't really sure what to make of that at first because he had no idea that these paintings were stolen in the first place. Um, but, you know, being a former police officer, he used his investigative experience to track down the photograph that we saw um, of the paintings from the college in the 1970s. And then he got in touch with local police who ultimately put him in touch with the police in Quebec who were able to confirm that the paintings in Montreal were in fact the same paintings that were stolen from the college in the 1980s. Now, we should mention that uh, a deal was made. Uh, those paintings are now in this province. They are back where they sort of belong and they were donated to uh, the local gallery there. We have a photo of, uh, a more recent photo of those paintings, Demigod 1 and Demigod 2. Tell us what we're looking at here. That's right. Yeah. So um, in reporting for the story, I got to go to the art gallery and meet with Sharon Godwin, who is um, the lady in that photo. And she's the director of the art gallery. Um, and, you know, she explained that it's important that these pieces are back here because of their history. You know, um, they belong in this region where Morriso did a lot of his work um, and lived a lot of his life. Right. As opposed to being in a private collector's collection hanging in their house where you know, not a lot of people get the opportunity to see them. Charnel, very important story, and very interesting story as well. Thank you so much for your time. And I should mention, for more on Norval Morriso, to check out our Art of Sovereignty podcast that explores the lives of eight First Nation artists. Thanks again, Charnel. Thank you. And that is tonight's agenda in the summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again next time. The agenda in the summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.